welcome to Baltimore, by the way. Baltimore has a lot of uh, notoriety for different things. It was actually Babe Ruth's birthplace, uh, lots of sports heroes, uh, and one of the medical heroes, I think, is uh, Hal Dietz, who kind of looks like Michael Phelps, maybe with the stethoscope turned upside down. Um, so I think it's really neat to see that uh, this condition is actually much more common than we thought and was described and understood uh, right here in Baltimore. So uh, I'd like to talk about some of these issues. First about recognition of Lois Dietz syndrome and then the musculoskeletal care with the goal that you'll understand the terms and the principles even though we don't always have solutions for all of these things. And we'll talk a little bit about the head, more about the neck, spine and back and some about the hips, knees, and especially the feet. And we'll go to leave some time for questions at the end. So um, as you know, it's a typical disease triad with serious internal changes in the arteries, uh, craniofacial changes, but the bone and joint and muscle findings are very common, although they're very variable. They can often serve as a window for recognition of this syndrome and then more targeted and appropriate care. The features of the skeleton are much more visible than those of the internal vascular abnormalities. And this can hopefully allow you to recognize the syndrome for possible diagnosis, better monitoring via imaging and genetic testing so that you can manage it and time your interventions appropriately and counsel uh, affected people about the best way to deal with all these internal uh, changes. Who cares about the skeleton? A lot of different people. The primary care provider, uh, will often be the one that can recognize features that you may not have recognized in your own body. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon probably is the one that, that uh, I'm most focused on. This is a specialist who can provide monitoring, can recommend bracing, splinting, and occasionally surgery. Uh, but also the geneticist uh, is often an expert in this. A uh, physical therapist may be called into play, and an occupational therapist may provide advice about hand management and functional interventions to deal with some disabilities related to the syndrome. We recently had the chance to study all the patients that came to Hopkins or through Hopkins with Lois Dietz syndrome and uh, have an article kind of illustrating at least initially uh, the musculoskeletal manifestations that occur in this syndrome. And we looked at uh, 65 patients who have Lois Dietz syndrome and uh, found out that they have many similarities to Marfan syndrome, but also a, a lot of notable differences. Their uh, arm span to height ratio is not as pronounced as uh, typically uh, you would see in Marfan syndrome, but a, 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 two thirds of them have a ratio that's more characteristic of a normal proportion. Many patients that were in this cohort had been diagnosed as having Marfan syndrome, but some also had a prior diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos and Sprintz and Goldberg syndrome. Um, these, were, these are things that are known to orthopedic surgeons to produce various skeletal findings, uh, but clearly the internal monitoring uh, of vascular and other features are, are much different. In the extremities, uh, arachnodactyly is very common. Uh, many people have a thumb sign and a wrist sign which indicate long, lax digits and narrow forearms um, in which you can place your thumb through the clenched fist or wrap your fingers around the forearm. This indicates a certain degree of laxity and a certain degree of elongation. Um, but uncharacteristic for, for Marfan syndrome or for Ehlers-Danlos, uh, many of these people had uh, camptodactyly, which is a a contracture of the fingers. Um, we saw that in at least 20% of patients, uh, and some of them actually required surgical correction, as you can see here. Two patients in this cohort had developmental dysplasia of the hip. Uh, one actually required hip replacement due to avascular necrosis, which may have been related to uh, the syndrome or may have been due to steroid or other uh, administration of agents that can cause avascular necrosis. In skeletal problems, you can also have a deepening of the hip socket called acetabular protrusion. That can be noted on x-ray or by CT scan. I'm sorry, I went backwards. This is what protrusion looks like, and this is actually a person evolving over time from the left to the right. Uh, and if you look at, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at the uh, hip sockets on the left side, the uh, the uh, 
distance between the inner part of the acetabulum and the pelvis uh, has at least five millimeters. But as this same person uh, became about five years older, you can see that this actually narrowed uncharacteristically to uh, basically just a wafer-thin shelf of bone, which is more characteristic of uh, Marfan syndrome and other uh, certain skeletal dysplasia. So this is seen in a, a proportion of uh, Louise Dietz patients that we don't completely know because not everybody has had a pelvis film. But this may have implications for hip problems later on down the road, limited range of motion, hip pain, possibly premature hip symptoms. One of the bigger functional problems is the laxity that occurs in the knee, especially side-to-side -side movement called valgus, um, hyperextension, which is bending backwards, as you can see here. And these are even more difficult to deal with if the muscles controlling the feet and the ankles are also lax or the foot has, a, has its own uh, deformity. Some of this can be improved by bracing, but bracing is also uh, sometimes, bracing can be uh, cumbersome, especially at the knee. Uh, sometimes there can be a malalignment correction by an osteotomy, which is usually successful, but ligament reconstruction is a bit more unsuccessful. Foot findings are very common in this syndrome and one of the reasons that patients with Lois Dietz syndrome often come to recognition. I've had a number of patients in my own practice that came through and we really had, they had no reason to come to Hopkins, anything other than their club feet. But we recognized that these club feet were more severe, uh, didn't behave normally, and there were some other features that led us to recognize Lois Dietz syndrome. Uh, and I think this is, this is a story that's probably going to evolve and become much more commonly recognized as, as uh, the awareness spreads. The, the, the syndrome is probably much more frequent than currently estimated. This is example, an example of uh, what we call a skew foot. Uh, it has deviation of the front and the back of the foot. Um, a flat foot is present in almost two-thirds of patients. A club foot we see in uh, at least 15 to 20 percent of patients, maybe either one side or both sides, um, and these are usually treated by standard methods, but they don't always respond to standard methods. We don't know why only some kids get club feet. Club feet are seen in the general population as well, but much, much less frequently. About one out of a thousand kids in the general population will have a club foot, but 15 to 25 percent of patients in Lois Dietz populations have a club foot. These Club feet do not improve without treatment. Typically with weight bearing, the foot turns in more and becomes almost inverted. Uh, this is not a Lois Dietz patient, but this is somebody from a South American mission that I saw with club foot who had uh, never received treatment. And this is what happens if you don't treat it. You basically walk on the side or the top of your foot and it kind of folds underneath. So we always have to treat a club foot so that you can stand on the foot and wear normal shoes and so forth. The treatment is basically starts out the same as it would for someone without Lois Dietz syndrome by a serial ca casting called Ponsetti casting in which you stretch out the deformity little by little with a cast and each time you take the cast off the foot corrects a little bit more and what used to be stiff becomes flexible and so you can actually mold the foot into a straighter position. The principles are that with this slow, gentle, but consistent stretch, you can stretch out tendons and joint capsules little by little without having to operate on them. By contrast, if you operate on the foot, you interrupt its blood supply and you cause it to grow abnormally and you create sudden misfits of the joints, which can later cause pain. So surgery in any club foot, Lois Dietz or not, is, is currently out of favor, uh, except as a last resort and a kind of a final procedure for what remains after Ponsetti casting. We try to correct with the club foot the various deformities which have special names, cavus, adduction, varus, and you don't really have to remember the names, but you realize that you have to apply these forces shown here to bring up the front of the foot and then slowly extra, externally re rotate it or bring it outward and then bring it upward to a straight position. And then sometimes at the end you have to do an Achilles tenotomy. These casts are put on as shown here, and we change them about once a week. They can be made out of either plaster or fiberglass, and usually you will see improvement little by little. And then sometimes an Achilles tendon lengthening may need be necessary because the Achilles tendon is the one thing that's 
too strong for the cast to correct sometimes, or it may actually cause the foot to kind of give in the middle as opposed to giving where it should be. And so we stretch out the Achilles tendon sometimes with a tenotomy under local anesthesia, and it actually regenerates. Then finally, after the club foot is corrected, we hold it in special braces called foot abduction orthoses. Uh, the most tolerable version here is the so-called Ponsetti brace uh, down at the bottom. And uh, these are soft, uh, soft leather shoes that uh, hold the foot in the external rotated position so the bones can mold themselves and grow into that position. And usually after about three to five years of age, they've reached a more consistent shape and don't tend to turn back in again. Uh, and so this is usually kind of the end of the treatment. Uh, the reason we call this Pansetti casting is because of the gentleman I showed earlier who was uh, Professor Ignacio Pansetti uh, from Iowa City who recently passed away. But he was adherent to the principles of non-operative correction throughout his life. And while most orthopedic surgeons were operating on club feet of all stripes, he realized that the stiffness and the disability are much less if you treat it non-operatively than if you treat it operatively. And so that's kind of an interesting story that's a testament to his uh, persistence and his belief in these principles. And he actually just passed away uh, at about age 99 after still still operating on, or still uh, treating kids with casts uh, up until the last year of his life. The, the, rate, the results of club foot correction are pretty good in the general population, and they're fair in Lois Dietz syndrome. Typically, you can go to the foot to a plantigrade position, which means you can stand on it. But in, uh, in Lois Dietz syndrome, there's a, a tendency to some residual midfoot malposition, such as adduction and hindfoot varus or valgus. There's a rare need for a comprehensive relief, release. In other words, the old-fashioned surgery that we used to do on club feet. We rarely do that anymore, except as a last resort. Um, I should also say that in Lois Dietz syndrome, uh, if you do operate on the club foot, you're more likely to get an overcorrection. In other words, the foot will slide into the opposite direction. It'll go out too far and it'll be hard to stand on, and it'll collapse into an excessively flat position. So especially in Lois Dietz syndrome, we really try to avoid operative operative uh, surgery uh, for fear of causing that, st that overcorrection and result in stiffness and pain down the road. Lesser forms of foot deformities can also occur in Lois Dietz syndrome, so-called metatarsis adductus, which is just turning into the front part of the foot. And this is also seen in the general population with about 1 to 3 percent, but it's seen in almost all people with Lois Dietz syndrome to some degree or another. Treatment uh, typically is stretching and observing, uh, sometimes casting in reverse shoes, and occasionally an osteotomy is rarely necessary to bring the foot into a straighter position. Many people with Lois Dietz syndrome have a skew foot, which is in, where, in a condition of turning into the front part of the foot and turning out of the back part of the foot. This can happen spontaneously with natural development, or it may happen after surgical treatment of club foot with overcorrection into valgus. The treatment for this is sometimes necessary to make the foot usable or plantigrade. And we will sometimes correct the back part of the foot by sliding it in, cutting the bone and shifting it over, and the front part of the foot by bringing it out. With all surgery on Lois Dietz syndrome, however, you have to realize that there's a significant risk of overcorrection. So we try to do as little as possible and to have our surgical goals limited to kind of a usable foot without minimal risk of overcorrection. Flat foot is also an aspect of Lois Dietz syndrome because of the ligamentous laxity. And this can, re can result in problems from inability to push off, the stability is lost, and also pressure where it's not supposed to be existing in the middle part of the arch of the foot. So here's an example of pressure on the medial midfoot where you shouldn't have any and, in, and laxity in push off of the foot. Orthotics cannot be used to reshape a foot. They may cause pain because they're often trying to force the foot into a shape it doesn't want to assume. It's my practice not to use orthotics routinely except to help symptoms of overpressure and callus formation but to expect a foot to reshape itself because of an orthotic just doesn't happen. And so I don't usually prescribe orthotics for most children with flat feet. 